Good afternoon, buenas tardes, desde el Instituto Cervantes de Manchester y Leeds. Uh, good afternoon from Instituto Cervantes in Manchester and Leeds. Uh, I am Pedro Eusebio, the, the director from Instituto Cervantes and uh, dear ambassador from Nicaragua to the United Kingdom, Isel Morales, dear Diana Culler, professor at the Liverpool University, uh, dear uh, participants, uh, dear audience, and uh, dear, of course, um, Adam uh, Feinstein, translator of the of the book, who, which uh, we are uh, commenting and reading today in this uh, uh, literary circle, literary, literary um, uh, poetry uh, meeting. Welcome to Instituto Cervantes, uh, where we are celebrating uh, the month of uh, Rubén Darío, uh, which we have programmed together with the Embassy of Nicaragua to the United Kingdom, and also with the cooperation of uh, Sherman Brooks, and today with the special support of the University of Liverpool. First of all, I would like to uh, thank uh, the Nicaraguan ambassador, Giselle Morales, and uh, as I mentioned, um, Adam Feinstein, the translator of the book, uh, uh, Ruben Darío Selected Poems, which is the author of the book, uh, who is the author, sorry, of the book, who, which uh, we are we going to, to read and to comment afterwards. Um, now I will introduce very briefly uh, Diana Kulel, who is uh, a very uh, uh, essential uh, uh, collaborator of the Instituto Cervantes in Manchester, of Instituto Cervantes as an institution. And uh, thank you very much again. We are very delighted uh, that this uh, meeting uh, might be possible due to your support and uh, the personality of uh, Diana Kuller, who is a very, very uh, dynamic uh, professor. Diana uh, completed her undergraduate uh, degrees in, in Spanish philology at the University of Gerona in Spain, and she completed a master degree in European languages and culture at the University of Manchester. She has also a PhD in Spanish literature at the University of Manchester, uh, which uh, work theme was the Poesia de la Resistencia. She joined then afterwards uh, the University of uh, Liverpool in 2008, and uh, where is now at the moment Professor of Spanish Studies. Diana Culel is specialized in Spanish and Catalan uh, literature, and uh, she has published widely on a range of writers' uh, literary movements. She is uh, particularly interested in uh, new forms of poetry and performance poetry. The topic of her latest uh, monograph is La Perfo Poesía Española en el Siglo XXI, Una uh, Revolución Poética the perform poetry of Spain in the 23rd century, a uh, poetic revolution. Uh, thank you very much, Diana. Thank you to all. Thank you to Adam. It's a real honor, pleasure. We are, I can have no words to say to, to thank you for this cooperation. We will be with Ruben Darío in this uh, month. Uh, but the main focus is also the book of uh, uh, Adam Feinstein. Thank you again. And now I hand uh, over the, to Her Excellency, the Ambassador of uh, Nicaragua to the United Kingdom, uh, Giselle Morales. Thank you very much. Muchas gracias a todos. Muchas gracias, um, Pedro. Eh, muchas gracias a todos, a ti, Diana, por acompañarnos today, hoy. Uh, thank you to everyone who is participating in this reading uh, and thank you to Anna for organize, for being part of it, for uh, being the moderator and the guidance and guide us uh, uh, in reading Ruben, uh, in reading the, uh, the selected poems, uh, the new book uh, trans of Ruben Darioso's uh, work. 
translated by Adam Feinstein, Professor Adam Feinstein, who is with he's here with us today. Okay. Uh, this is uh, this is his second edition. Uh, we edited one in Nicaragua. We published one in Nicaragua, and this is the second work he has done. Uh, on Robin Darío, and we're looking for more, of course, uh, so you can read it in Spanish and English. This is a beautiful book. It has two, um, it's, it's, it's a bilingual, it has the Spanish and the and the English version. And, and more importantly, uh, as Adam always said, he tried to uh, keep the musicality and be faithful to the soul of the words of the poets of the of of, of, of the verse of the poet so um i i am very happy to be part of it i i think i have to thank uh, instituto cervantes for dedicating this month to 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 Rubén darío as the author of the month and 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 also to recognize and pay tribute to the contribution of Ruben to the uh, evolution of the language and to um, the way we write poetry today in Spanish. Uh, uh, Brosa also because he also was a very good writer in. Uh, uh, Cuentos, uh, tales, and and storytelling, uh, stor stories, and 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 even political prose. So, <laughs> so um, uh, I will pass now to Diana, and and welcome all. And I hope you enjoy it. Thank you so much, Giselle. Well, let me let me just start saying how how much of a pleasure it is really to be here with you this evening um, i would like to thank obviously the cervantes for inviting me um, to take part in this month dedicated to uh, ruben darío but especially to pedro Eusebio, to giselle morales uh, the ambassador and to adam for the amazing translation of um, ruben darío i was saying earlier how um I mean, it's it's so special being here tonight because I'm not here tonight as an expert on Ruben Darío. Um, uh, my work has mainly focused on Spanish Peninsular poetry, so I'm here tonight to read this, uh, to lead this um, reading club, not as an expert on Darío's poetry, but as a real reader of Darío's poetry. So I've always deeply, deeply admired Ruben Darío's work. And um, I was telling um, them before we started how, obviously I'm from that generation of uh, Spanish students who read Ruben Darío in the high school, learned um, to really appreciate his uh, poetry. But then one day, my life and my view of his poetry completely changed when I was an undergraduate student at the University of Girona and we were in a class that had nothing to do with Ruben Darío. We were in a class talking about Spanish Romanticism and Becker and we were talking about this sense of ennui, this sense of you know, this quietness, suffering, these existential doubts. And the class was taught by Javier Cercas, the Spanish novelist, who was my lecturer at the time. And all of a sudden talking about, you know, these existential doubts, he just stopped and said, one second, I just have something very important to say. And he just recited Lo Fatal by Rubén Darío. And it was like, you know, the penny dropped and I just suddenly found the explanation to so many things um, in life. So that was a really, really defining moment on my own readings of Ruben Darío, not just as someone who had read his poems because, you know, it was in the reading list in high school, but as someone who could really, really relate to what Ruben Darío was saying. So uh, I have obviously selected Lo Fatal tonight to read with you, since that was such a turning point for me in my readings of, uh, of Ruben Darío. But I have also selected another two poems. So we will save Lo Fatal for, for the end. 
the way I have structured this, so I've prepared the PowerPoint um, with the original and with Adam's translation, um, so that we can all see uh, the translation that uh, Adam has prepared. And I want to really encourage you to take part in this. This is supposed to be a reading club, so I don't, I don't really expect me just talking all the time. I'm happy to, you know, read the lead the first reading, um, the, the first poem that we will look at, but then I would really, really like you to take part in the discussion uh, as a proper, you know, reading club. Poetry is something amazing. There are how many of us here? 18 of us here. It means that when we read the poems, there will be 18 different interpretations of the poem. And none is more valid than another. We will all interpret the poems in different ways, but that's, that's the beauty of it. Poetry is so subjective. I'm sure that Adam fought with himself when he was translating um, the poems in how, you know, the interpretation is so important as well when, uh, when you are translating. So I don't want you to be afraid or, or you know, just, just share your thoughts. Yeah, we are here to all learn from each other. So, so I hope that you will take part um, in the discussion and, and that we will all learn from, from everyone's uh, interpretations um, of um, the poems. Um, if, if we get carried away and maybe, you know, we want to have a smaller groups, maybe for the last poem that we will read, we can um, have two breakout rooms and discuss the poem um, in a smaller group. We'll see how it goes uh, and, and, you know, you can say whether you prefer that or that we stay um, in just um, one big group. Um, but this is how I had envisaged tonight and this reading club. Just we will look at three poems that hopefully will encourage you to read a lot more of Rubén Darío's work, um, because that, that, that's the main point of us reading here. This is just a starting point um, to celebrate um, this month uh, of um, Rubén Darío. So I'll share my screen. I've got um, just uh, the PowerPoint with, with the poems. Um, also, I don't know if... Um, some of you were um, here last Thursday. Can you all see the screen? Yes, great, fantastic. Um, so I don't know. Uh, this is obviously the the wonderful um, picture of the of the book, the the portada, and I. I don't know if you were um, here on Thursday when Adam introduced the book and, and he read from the book, etc. So I just put some um, very, you know, key parts um, for those of you who are less familiar with um, Ruben Darío. Um, uh, so you've got uh, they're born uh, in Metapa, in, Ita in Nicaragua in 1867. He's considered to be the father of modernismo, but also he's known as el principio de las letras. He was very influenced by French symbolists, and he's really well known in Spanish for how much he revolutionized poetic structure, how he modernized, almost single-handedly, I would say, uh, poetry in Spanish. So we will see, even in the poems that we will read today, how he played um, with rhythm, with meter, with imagery. And because he was a journalist as well as a diplomat, he worked in many parts of the world, in Costa Rica, Cuba, Buenos Aires, Spain, France. Um, so obviously his influence is felt um, um, a lot wider because, because of that. Um, just as part of the introduction that uh, Adam wrote for uh, the translation, these few lines really, really resonated with me and I wanted um, to read them with you before we look at the poems. So Adam said that Darius' poetry lives on today because it deals with universal themes to which we can all relate. Love, sexual longing, friendship, hopes, regrets, beliefs, doubts, death. 
it retains its power because it is imbued with so many modern internal contradictions, like the poet himself, between the, between the revolutionary and the traditionalist, between the spiritual and the erotic, between love and despair. And this is something that we will see um, in, in the poems as well. So the first poem, oops, oh, I'm sorry, can, can you see it? Can, can you read it well? Or the, it appears a bit blurred in, in my screen, but hopefully it will be enough to, to read it. So this is the first poem that I selected. Um, it's De Invierno, it's a poem uh, from Azul. And if it's okay, I'll read the Spanish uh, original. And then if we've got someone brave um, in the reading club that wants to read the English translation by Adam, that would be great. So um, let me read De Invierno. En invernales horas, mirad a Carolina. Medio apelotonada, descansa en el sillón, envuelta con su abrigo de Marta Cibelina y no lejos del fuego que brilla en el salón. El fino angora blanco junto a ella se reclina, rozando con su hocico la falda de Alenzón, no lejos de las jarras de porcelana china que medio oculta un biombo de seda del Japón. Con sus sutiles filtros la invade un dulce sueño. Entro sin hacer ruido. Dejo mi abrigo gris. Voy a besar su rostro rosado y halagueño como una rosa roja que fuera flor de lis. Abre los ojos, mírame con su mirar risueño y en tanto cae la nieve del cielo de París. Do we have a volunteer that can read it in English? I'm happy to, if Paul. Yes, absolutely, go ahead, thank okay. you so much. In winter, in the long winter hours, gaze on Carolina. There she sits, curled up in her chair, wrapped in her brown sable coat. Have you seen her warming herself by the living room fire? The white nose of the fine Angora rug beside her nestles snug in her skirt of Alençon lace. Not far from the vases of porcelain china half hidden by Japanese silk screens, her face is softened by sleep's sweet invasion. I enter in silence, remove my grey coat and kiss her face all pink persuasion, like a red rose which used to be an iris. She opens her eyes with a smile that provokes, and outside, it's snowing again in Paris. Thank you so much, Paul. That was a beautiful, beautiful reading. Um, hopefully you will have seen, even in the English translation, how the poem retains the rhythm, yes? Um, and I know that Adam paid a lot of attention to retaining uh, the rhythm and the rhyme in, in the poems. So, so um, that's, that's amazing. So I don't know if anyone has any immediate thoughts or you want me to just say a couple of things about the poems. Had, had anyone read the poem, this poem before? No? Okay, so I'll just, um, I'll just mention a couple of things. So with regards to the structure, if you look at the poem, okay, it follows the structure of what we call, you know, a sonnet, okay, but it's a sonnet made of uh, 14 syllable lines. So the, what we in Spanish call uh, Alejandrinos. Is it, Alex, how do you call that, how do you say that in English? Is it the... Alejandro. Okay, so we would probably expect, uh, you know, a sonnet um, to have um, 11 syllable lines, and this one is made of um, 14 syllable lines, which gives it, you know, um, much, uh, much more of a majestic rhyme, yeah? Uh, it reinforces the musicality um, of the line. So you can see here how um, Ruben Darío started to play, yeah, with the structures, modernizing them, changing things, 
um, also um, in the first two stanzas in, a, in what we would consider, you know, a regular sonnet, we um, would expect um, those, standard, uh, those stanzas to have a rhythm of um, A, B, B, A, and he changes that as well as lightly. So he he changes, he alters um, the expectations. Yeah, he, he he challenges the expectations of the reader in terms of um, the structure. Um, but what about the poem? So obviously, you know, in terms of the form, is is very innovative. But what about the themes? So if I ask someone. What is the the you know the surface meaning? What what? Let's not talk about themes, but but what happens in the poem on a superficial level? Anyone has any idea? So we've got this lady, Carolina. We've got these very luxurious surroundings. Nothing else. We've got these the poetic voice that comes in um, in um, in the in the third stanza. Intro sin hacer ruido. So the poetic voice as a character comes into this room or whatever we are. So if we look at it on a superficial um, meaning, we've got this this poem. There is a female character reclining on on a, on a, a sillon on this uh, chair um, and um, we we learn about the the surroundings the room where she is and then we've got the poetic voice this uh, other character that comes in okay and and sees her um obviously the 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 poem tells us a lot more than this, okay? And we could actually almost break the poem down into two parts. The first uh, two stanzas, the the um, the first two stanzas, we can see the the female character just lying in this sillon, um, resting, okay? And um, so we are. Um, we learn about her, okay, um, and look at how she's presented. So we know it's winter in, in Invernales uh, Horas, um, and the poetic voice tells us, look at Carolina, hmm? mirad a Carolina. So we're told, just, just look at her, gaze on her. But I think that Adam did really, really well on this gaze on Carolina because it's almost as if the, if the poetic voice is, is encouraging us on enjoying this view, yeah? He's not just saying, look at her. He's like, gaze on her, like really appreciate, you know, the, the, the way she's there. We know that she's medio apelotonada, so curled up. Um, in this in this sillon resting and she um, is wrapped in this coat but it's not normal coat it's not just you know something that you you use to keep yourself warm is this Marta Cibelina this sable coat so we've got this uh, sense of luxury yes something that you can almost you don't only see, you can almost touch it, you can feel it, the comfort that it gives. Hmm? Warming herself um, by this fire, but this el fuego que brilla, so it's a fire that almost gives light rather than not just warmth, but it's also light. So as you can see, Rubén Darío is playing with all our sensory imagination, yeah? So there is the tactile aspect of the uh, abrigo de Marta Cibelina, and there is this um, light in the fire, the warmth, so putting all our senses into play. Hmm? Um, we've got um, this in the, in the second stanza, 
el fino angora blanco junto a ella se reclina. Um, and this is another example of how beautiful poetry is. I had always read this as, you know, being this white cat, um, this white, um, is the, the Angora cat, is it Turkish, I think, from origin, like a, 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 but a very exotic cat. So this is what I think the reference to the Angora rook or cat or whatever we, how, however we interpret it, comes in, like it's the, the, the exoticism um, uh, that it uh, 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 gives to the poem. Mm -hmm. This um, rozando con su hocico la falda de Alenzón, this reference to, len, to lace. So again, um, luxury, exoticism. It's painting a picture of the surroundings, um, um, a, a very, you know, luxurious idea for, for the room that represents, in a way, Carolina. So Carolina, this character, is embodied as well in, in this room that surrounds her. Um, then we've got um, the references to the um, porcelain china, the Japanese silk screens, um, and also this, and in the third stanza, this dulce sueño, la invade un dulce sueño. And this is something that we will see in all the um, poesia modernista, in Darío, all these references to dreams, to dreamlike states, yes, where we don't know what's real, what's not, we don't know whether we are dreaming, whether it's our reality. Mm -hmm. But it says, sutiles filtros la invade un dulce sueño, so she's falling asleep. And he comes in. Mm -hmm. um, so in this first part, is the inside, yes, of this room. We've seen the female character inside these four walls, surrounded by exotic um, elements, really luxurious elements. And he comes in, being very silent, and removes the grey coat. And this is a massive contrast, yeah? Everything has been, you know, with this light and so, so refinado, as we would say, and he comes in with an abrigo gris. Hmm? So an immediate clash of the outside, this abrigo, this coat that represents the outside, contrasting with um, the environment inside. Voy a besar su rostro rosado y alagueño. And then she wakes up or abre los ojos uh, with this smile. And we can see again how he becomes part of this because it says, uh, uh, and I think that the translation is even better, and outside it's snowing again in Paris. So we've got the clear difference between the inside and the outside. The poem actually ticks all the boxes of the um, modernista poetry eroticism or at least sensuality in the way Carolina is viewed, yeah? Which, you know, she's presented as this very sensual person um, in this very refined uh, room, um, but also this dream state, the dream-like um, environment, uh, be the, the female beauty, which is another um, element, escaping reality as well. Um, that's another point, I think, that the poem really touches upon, like escaping the outside, going inside, trying to forget what happens um, outside. Um, the, the, the taste, the preference for, you know, aristocracy. And isn't the flor de lis as well, the, the, the flower that represents French aristocracy, um, I, I believe? Um, so we've got all, all of this in, in the poem, this, this very clear um, um, modernista um, aspects um, in, in it. And then if we wanted to look more, um, I've mentioned, you know, the sensory input of the poem, but also if you look at the first um, line, En hibernales horas mirad a Carolina, this alliteration with all the R's 
are a repetition of the importance of the name Carolina, yeah, with the with the R. And this happens in many other parts of um, the poem. So this is all I had to say about the, the, the poem. I would be very interested in listening to what um, uh, you, you uh, want to say about it, whether you've got completely different readings to the one that I've presented. So um, I'm very happy to, to just um, listen to, to you because we're here to all learn from, from each other's reading. So I know someone in the chat, um, Oh, sorry, I, sh I, shared st uh, I stopped sharing my screen. I know someone in the chat had uh, something to say as well. Um, so feel free to, to just unmute yourself and, and share your, your thoughts. I can put the poem back again if, if that helps. I think uh, Lester wanted to... Oh, Giselle. You are muted. No, I was going to say that Lester was, I think, asking to participate in the conversation. But anyway, I just going to say that when you read this poem, every time you read it, you are there in that room and you feel the cold of the of the of 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 of. of of the uh, snow you 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 can you can also touch it and you also feel the warmth uh inside the room you know you feel the cold outside you feel the warmth inside and the beauty of carolina you you can om almost imagine her her beauty you know uh, her laziness you know like you know waking up and the this connection that the poet has with her is 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 just there. It's like you are seeing a movie with both of them. You know, a picture of both of them uh, uh, there. So it takes you to that moment where you you are just like a, a ter like like a, like a vision, like you having a vision, and and it feels of uh, of. Uh, and it fills your heart, uh, you know, it fits your soul. It's, it's, it's just uh, so soft at the same time. The music, it takes you there. That's, uh, now I, I pass to Lester, <laughs> that's all. <laughs> Hello. Hi, oh, Lester. He's a poet, by the way. I'm trying, I'm learning, I'm moving on to see. Yeah, I didn't know this group existed. Thank you, Alan, you invited me, and you too, Lisa. Uh, I think this is one of my favorite poems from by Dario. And why? The reason for me is that it's a very cinematographic poem, if I could call it that way, because you can see what is going on in the moment, scene after scene, um, and it's a very round poem, if I could call it this way as well, because the title, from the, from the title, I get introduced to the scene, which is the invierno or in winter. And then the first line is start by saying, en invernales horas, or in English, in the long winter hours. And it's the way also it finished. And it, it, this is the, one of the image that the strikes me the most probably how the poem ends by saying it's snowing again in Paris so for me I can see all those things that I agree with you said that when she said that I can see uh, everything happening going and event after event happening um, yeah I also I think that the the joy of reading these poems is not necessarily the story because he's not telling us is describing us a scene. Um, yes, I enjoy reading the musicality in the poem. It's a magic poem and it's also a sonnet full of rhymes and music. Um, I wanted to also mention that for me, this is a contrast in the work of the Rio because most of the time I have found in the poems I read from him that there are, there is, most of the time there is a story too that is tall, but in this poem, 
it's the joy for me to read and see what is going on in this simple scene where it's snowing. <laughs> Thank you. Um, that's what I wanted to share. Thank you. Thanks, Lester, and thanks, Gisela, as well, for your contributions. I think that what you've both said clearly re reflect, you know, the, the readings that you can make of the poem, how, you know, the sensory, uh, what you create sensorily for the reader, it, it is like we are actually seeing this happening in front of our eyes. Um, it's almost as if we go into the room with the uh, with the male character, and 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 that that is just uh, amazing. Do we have anyone else who wants to to contribute um, their reading? I mean, I don't want to put anyone on the spot, but. Um... Feel free, feel free to to add anything. Did you did you like it? Hello. Hi, Chris. Hi. Uh, I should I should say, uh, Diana, that um, I'm pretty new to poetry. I've been doing quite a bit of American and some Irish poetry recently, and I heard about this book, bought a copy, not had time to open it. But if this is the the standard of what we're going to get, it's it really good. Um, so cinematic, um, it, it, it's the quality of the wordsmithery, if you like, that um, it, it's, it's so good, it really is good. Uh, it has all the elements that you said, it ticked all the boxes, and uh, I really enjoyed your analysis of the poem, I thought that was excellent. It was useful for me as a new, fairly new person to uh, poetry, but wow. Um, yes, I can see why he's highly regarded. I, I thought it was an immensely good pro, uh, poem. Yeah. Oh, thank you, Chris. I'm sure you are in for a treat. For the, if you read the rest of the book, you'll see. You'll really, really enjoy it. <laughs> thank uh, you. Paul, Paul here. Just uh, a, a quick comment on the on the translation, really, for uh, Professor Einstein. Um, the translation, as well, scans beautifully. There's always a, a problem between balancing the sense and the rhythm. How difficult did you find that to balance these almost at times competing aspects in your translation? Uh, can I say something? Please. Yeah, go ahead. Please. <laughs> uh, that's such a good point, Paul. Very good. You know, we translators, we are always walking this tightrope between meaning and sound between meaning and music it's the it's the major obstacle the, the, the major obstacle to getting it right is is trying to find the balance what do we sacrifice in fact in a way it's easier with that eel because the meaning lies in the music so you don't lose you have there's no, you don't have any choice. You have to keep the music, which is why, I, which is why I use the rhyme. So if you if you lose the music, you lose you lose the meaning in Dario's. A, a large part of his poetry lies in the sound and the music musicality. So, um, but it, but it, having said that, it's uh, having said that, it's still a challenge. Um, and as you see, if you look at the example. I take in the, the, the eighth line, the, the second line, of the, the last line of the second stanza, I take over, I, I, I take over her face, I take over from the third stanza to the, back to the second stanza. Now that's not just to rhyme with lace. I agree, I do that. I'm being a bit cheeky. Uh, I don't think that he would have minded because he was so revolutionary in his use of structure. And enjambement, and especially enjambement, you know, the uh, a, a leading, a, using a line to lead on to the next, or the next stanza. He wouldn't have mind me doing this. Uh, so I did it for the rhyme, but also to keep to keep the, the rhythm and to keep the sense. Um, and I think it leads, and also you've been talking, several people tonight have been talking very, very well and very wisely about the, the, the fact that we we kept moving like a story through the poem. It's like a narrative. So I thought that if, if I bring back that, that line, her face, it leads the reader on to the third stanza. You can't help but 
follow and see what happens next. You know, where, what about her face? Where, you know, what about it? So you read on. So I think uh, that was a challenge. It was a, so I, again, I think that I was justified in doing that, but it's always, as I say, with, a, with a, any translator, you have to uh, keep as loyal to the meaning that the poet intended but at the same time, if you lose that sound, um, you're losing part of any great poem. As I said on thir last Thursday, any great poem has to sing. It has to sing. If, it's, if it doesn't sing, it, you're, it's not a great poem. And I mean, if any poems sing, it's, it's the wonderful poems of Rubin uh, Dario. Um, so I think, but that's such a good point, Paul, to talk about uh, about the meaning versus the, the music. Um, that great antagonism in any, in any translator's life. And um, that's what you face up with. You face up to that. And um, I, hope, I hope that I've met the challenge head on. And um, that it's up to the reader to say, obviously. It's up to you, the readers, to say whether it's worked or not. Well, when I read the poem, I, it's the first time I've come to it, and the rhythm in your translation made it very easy to read. It flowed, um, and I think the translation is beautiful as well. Thank you. Well, thank thank you very much. I appreciate that. Fantastic. So I think that if no one else has anything to say in particular about this poem, maybe we could move on. <coughs> Um, I need the, so I selected three poems. I mean, it's great that we have, you know, a proper discussion and we all share our thoughts. So I'm happy to do just two poems or do we have time for three? Um, Carlos, you or Pedro Eusebio, you are the boss here. Um, yes, you have time. Yeah, I'll have time. Okay, great. So then the, the following poem that I selected uh, was the Sonatina. So it, this is a, a slightly um, longer poem, so it spreads throughout two, two pages, but um, you know, we'll try to move quickly so that then we can really, really read uh, Lo Fatal. Um, so again, I'll read the Spanish version and then again, if I can have a volunteer or we can rely on Paul again if no one else uh, uh, wants to, to have a go. Um, so I'll read the, the sonatina. La princesa está triste. ¿Qué tendrá la princesa? Los suspiros se escapan de su boca de fresa. Que ha perdido la risa, que ha perdido el color. La princesa está pálida en su silla de oro. Está mudo el teclado de su clave sonoro y en un vaso olvidada se desmaya una flor. El jardín puebla el triunfo de los pavos reales. Parlanchina, la dueña, dice cosas banales y vestido de rojo piruetea el, el bufón. La princesa no ríe, la princesa no siente. La princesa persigue por el cielo de oriente la libélula vaga de una vaga ilusión. ¿Piensa acaso en el príncipe de Golconda o de China, o en el que ha detenido su carroza argentina para ver sus ojos la luz de luz, la dulzura de luz? ¿O en el rey de las islas de las rosas fragantes, o en el que es soberano de los claros diamantes, o en el dueño orgulloso de las perlas de Hormuz? ¡Ay, la pobre princesa de la boca de rosa, quiere ser golondrina, quiere ser mariposa! Trenar as ligeras bajo el cielo volar. Ir al sol por la escala luminosa de un rayo. Saludar a los lirios con los versos de mayo. O perderse en el viento sobre el trueno del mar. Ya no quiere el palacio ni la rueca de plata. Ni el halcón encantado ni el bufón escarlata. Ni los cisnes unánimes en el lago de azur. Y están tristes las flores por la flor de la corte los jazminos de oriente, los nelumbos del norte, de occidente las dalías y las rosas del sur. Pobrecita princesa de los ojos azules, está presa en sus oros, está presa en sus tules, en la jaula de mármol del palacio real, 
el palacio soberbio que vigilan los guardas, que custodian cien negros con sus cien alabardas, un lebrel que no duerme y un dragón colosal. O oh, quien fuera Ipsila que dejó la crisálida, la princesa está triste, la princesa está pálida. Oh, visión adorada de oro, rosa y marfil, quien volara la tierra donde un príncipe existe, la princesa está pálida, la princesa está triste, más brillante que el alba, más hermoso que abril. Calla, calla, princesa, dice la hada madrina, en caballo, con alas, hacia acá se encamina, en el cinto la espada y en la mano el azor, el feliz caballero que te adora sin verte, que, que llega de lejos vencedor de la muerte, a encenderte los labios con un beso de amor. Do we have anyone who wants to read the translation in English? Do you want me to read again yes, if there one of us wants to? <laughs> Paul, you would be great. <laughs> <laughs> I'll try. I, I haven't read this poem before either, so. Uh, Bear with me, but uh, Sonatina. The princess is sad, whatever gives. Sighs escape from her strawberry lips, lips that have lost their laughter, their color. The princess is pallid in her golden chair. No sweet keyboard music fills the air and an abandoned glass grasps a fainting flower. A garden harbors the peacock's triumph while the lady in waiting spouts banal bumph. The court jester pirouettes in red, but the princess won't laugh. The princess feels numb in the eastern sky lit by the setting sun. The princess spies a dragonfly, a vague illusion, it said. Is she thinking of princes in China or Golconda? Of one who stopped his silver carriage to ponder the sweet flare in her eyes, those blazing swirls? Or maybe the king of fragrant rose isles, or the diamond lord with his brilliant smiles, or else the proud owner of Hormuth's pearls. The princess with the rose blossom mouth sighs, and she dreams she's a swallow, a butterfly, soaring up to the sky with her gossamer wings, climbing to the sun up a lightning bolt ladder, greeting lilies with may poems, or still madder, a stray in the wind as the sea thunder sings. She has no need for palace nor silver jenny, nor her enchanted falcon, the scarlet jester, or the many swans flocking in the lake of blue. To this flower princess, all other flowers feel somber. In the east, the jasmine, in the north, the nelumbo, in the west, the dahlia, in the south, roses too. Poor little princess with her deep blue eyes. She's a prisoner of gold of her tulle disguise. Caged in the marble of the royal palace, kept safe by the guards whom she's never liked. A hundred dark-skinned sentries with sharp-tipped pikes, a non-sleeping hound, a colossal dragon. If only she were a hipsipily patched from a pupa, the princess is sad in a pallid stupor. Adorable vision of gold, rose, and marble. If she could fly to a land where her prince was waiting, she's pale and sad. This scarcely needs restating. A prince, bright as an April dawn and more carnal. Hush, hush, little princess, says the fairy godmother. Here comes the prince from somewhere or other. On his winged horse, a hawk and sword at his waist, the fortunate man who adores you unsighted, winning out over death in love and delighted to inflame your lips with love's tender taste. Fantastic. Thank you so much for this amazing uh, reading. It's, it's fantastic to listen to you reading the, the translation. So, as you can see, this poem, obviously, uh, uh, slightly longer, as I said, we've got eight stanzas in here of six lines um, each. But again, we've got this musicality 
um, do the poem. And it reads quite easily and, uh, and quickly um, as well. Um, the, the title, Sonatina, obviously gives us the, the reference to, to music and musicality. Um, it's similar to the, to the sonata, if I'm not wrong, I'm not a great expert on, on music, um, but it's easier um, to execute and, and shorter as well. But again, musicality playing a massive, massive role in, in the poem. So what do we have here? I selected this poem um, so uh, as you will see, the three the three poems that I selected were selected for very different reasons. The the first one I was interested in the in the sensuality of the poem, in how it played with our senses, the the cinematic aspect of it, but also how we could almost feel part of it, like we were inside experiencing um, the the poem, and I selected. Um, a sonatina, um, not just because I've always really liked the structure of, of the poem and how it plays with the, with the rhythm and the rhyme, but also because it talks about something to me that is quite timeless. Um, so, you know, it's, it's um, a poem about this, um, the desires of this caged princess, someone who seems to have it all but still wants something else. And um, she's in, obviously in this golden cage, dreaming of other walls, of escaping, um, that longs to be rescued. Um, so it's a poem about escapism or um, evasión, as we would um, say in Spanish. Um, and we've got loads of references again to dreams because that's the way we can escape, uh, dreaming up, conjuring different walls and faraway um, lands. Um, also, you know, enchanted walls, um, dreamy visions, but it also has all these exotic elements that we, that we saw before, exotic places. And it's almost like a fairy tale, a medieval fairy tale. We've got, you know, the Ada Madrina, the, the fairy goddess at the end. But I, I would be completely unable to place it in a time precisely. And that's why I said that to me it reads as something that's timeless. Um, and I think that's another of the beauty uh, when you read uh, Ruben Darío, that's his poetry is timeless, just as this poem shows. This desire to escape, this desire for other lands, other walls, um, is happening now, it was happening back then, and I'm sure it will happen in a hundred years. So this desire to escape and find new places will always follow humanity. So that's one of the reasons why um, I selected um, the, the, the poem. Um, a few things that I would like to highlight. So in terms of, you know, the, the, the poem, we've got in here all these rhetoric questions, the preguntas retóricas, all these questions that we'll never have answers to, yeah? But are there to prompt us as readers? Um, ¿Qué tendrá la princesa? And this is what sometimes what we wonder, we've got everything we want, but we still want more. Why, yeah? Um, ¿Qué tendrá la princesa? All these repetitions, the, the structure, if you look at the structure of the poem, que ha perdido la risa, que ha perdido el color, hmm? the repetition of the structures that create, obviously, this rhythm and this rhyme as well um, in, in the poem. We also have alliteration um, in this poem. You've got the line there where it says, la princesa persigue por el cielo de oriente. Hmm? And, and this obviously makes us read the, the line um, uh, much more quickly, uh, more, you know, um, um, questions um, for us. Um, and for me, the most amazing thing is in the poem comes towards the end, in the final two stanzas, when we've got this 
parentheses, la princesa está triste, la princesa está pálida, almost as if we hadn't noticed um, before throughout the poem, like something that we need to pay attention to, like something is changing um, in the poem. Hmm? And also these exclamations, Oh, visión adorada de oro, rosa y marfil. Mm -hmm. uh, and again, the repetitions, but with um, the change of structures. So before it was la princesa está triste, la princesa está pálida, and then la princesa está pálida, la princesa está triste. And this Ada Madrina at the end, adding, you know, this ray of hope, calla, calla, princesa. Um, that now things, things will change. So I've always been drawn to this poem. I don't know if it's the, the, the fairy tale or, or, you know, the desire to escape and always the hope that there is um, behind, but I've always, always been uh, attracted to, to the uh, um, sonatina. So I would be very happy to, to listen to what you have to, what you make of, of the poem, if I may ask. Do we have a brave volunteer that wants to go first? I'm honestly really, really interested in, uh, oh, Gisela and, and, and then Paul. Sorry, you say someone first? Yeah, yeah, go, go, go Paul if you want then, yeah. Okay. Um, I, I agree with you. Um, you empathize almost with her sense of, of yearning in this comes through doesn't it really? She's yearning for something she hasn't got, despite the fact she's in a golden cage. Um, and, and the rhythm, as you say, drives you rapidly through this story. Um, there's just one thing I'd like to say about the, the translation. I love the penultimate verse in the Spanish, uh, La Princesa Esta, Palida La Princesa Esta Triste. Um, but Adam says she's pale and sad, this scarcely needs restating. Uh, and I just think that's a very, I mean, it's implicit uh, in the Spanish, but Adam almost sort of twists the knife a little bit more. And I, I think that's a lovely bit of translation. I, I, I love that. And I think that's where we are talking about the balance between capturing the mood, uh, the rhythm, and the literal translation. I think that's a classic example of how you have to balance those off. And I think it works really well. Absolutely. Thank you, Paul. Yeah. Uh, I'll, I'll, I'll hand over to somebody else at this point. I don't want to take over. <laughs> so, did you want to say something? I, did I ask you to say something very quickly? Or somebody, unless somebody else has something first. Yeah, I think I think Isel wanted to say something, but you are on mute. No, 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 it's fine. Go ahead. <laughs> Uh, what I wanted to say is we grew up with this, uh, uh, you know, reciting, reading this, uh, this sonatina and, 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 and also, you know, um, uh, dreaming like, uh, like the princess, uh, dreaming about a future of freedom. And I would say that this is, although this talk about a princess is a princess that is uh, various stereotype, you know, a princess of, uh, you know, a, kin a kingdom in any in any country in in, in Europe because he she has um, he she's described as uh, blue eyes and 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 um, she has a buffon she um, and and uh, um, she has the red lips, the boca rosa, uh, and and um, and she's surrounded by gold and all uh, and everything. You know, like you said, a, a cage or a gold cage, and there are guards and everything that um, she can have everything she can, uh, but it's lack. Like, of freedom, the first thing she realized, the aspiration to love and be loved, not because uh, the love, um, and, and that makes uh, young girls to em empathize uh, with her. And, um, and you have seen this uh, sonatina being um, included uh, or uh, uh, 
as a tale for, 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 for a story for, for, for little girls. But I will say that it, in a sense, um, now that you read it at my age, it's, it's, it's the despair of, in that time, the life that could have a young girl uh, and the debate between that in that moment was to get married with your prince or having the freedom to be a golondrina, a mariposa, to reach for the sun and to lose yourself in the, in the wind. Um, so that, I, I think it is a, there is a gender debate there you know, uh, of equality. So you can continue, you know, although maybe in love with your, with, with your prince or you, you will be free or you can have both. Is it possible? So it, it makes you question that. Um, I know, I know at the end is, 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 is the, you know, is the more appropriate ending for that time but um but i think it question it question um you know in a in a very subtle way in a very beautiful way in a very uh um uh poetic way um this uh this dichotomy and even the, the, the when you think about sonatina and you, it comes from, like you said, sonata. Um, it, normally, in in the in the classic sonata, you have always two themes that contrast. So he, that I would say, is her uh, aspiration from liberty and her wish to have a love and live forever with that love in, in, in without risking um, the, that uh, when you look for freedom and you fight for freedom, you know, you can, you can lose a love, the love of your life. So I think it's, it's that moment when women started to debate their, their role in, in the society. Thank you. That's uh, that that. <laughs> I mean, you, you summarized <laughs> the poem really well, and its challenges as well as you know how to uh, how to explain it. I mean, some of the criticisms that the the modernista, the, the poesia modernista, has received is this you know how, how the male gaze and how it viewed women and how you know they presented women and and female beauty, etc. But. Uh, uh, I do, I do read the poem as yeah, it, it's a princess, but it can, you can apply it to absolutely everyone as well. So it 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 has this this flexibility, and and it happens to be the prince at the end, but it might be you know knowledge, whatever you know. Um, so thank you, thank you, Giselle, for all this reflection. I think that Giovanni had something to say. Giovanni, you you raised your hand. So I don't know if Giovanni can hear us. And maybe not, because I know that someone else had um, some technical issues. They could hear us, uh, but but they couldn't um, really contribute. So does anyone have anything else to add? Nothing. Adam, did you want to say something? Yeah, I just wanted to say something very quick. You could switch back to the first page, Diana. Yeah, yeah. One second. Uh, I'll, very, I'll be very brief. I don't want to. Yeah. So it's the it's a, it's one of the problems we're talking. Going back to Paul's question, excellent question about uh, meaning versus music. Um, and a trap. There's a trap in this poem for an English translator. Second stanza, you've got a line: "Palancina la duena dice cosas banales." Now. For a translator, you look at Duena and you think that must be the owner. Duena normally means owner, but that doesn't make any sense in the context here. It can't be the owner talking, the owner will be the princess. Um, and it says, saying uh, banal bump or talking, not, but actually the princess is silent. It can't be that, it can't be. So, the, so you have to think, what's going on here? What is Dario saying? The owner? 
is saying, uh, talking nonsense, but we, he's told us the princess is silent. Can't be the owner. There's an older meaning for duenya. Much, much older, which means a princess is a royal lady in waiting. And especially if you look at the Real Academia de la Lengua, the, the, the uh, Spanish Academy, Royal Academy uh, de defini definition of duenya, it means a talkative lady in wait. So it works perfectly. Palanchina means a gossip. So it works perfectly to use lady in waiting. Whereas if I'd had owner, it would have been completely and utterly wrong. So there's just one of the many traps translators of Dario have to have to cope with. Um, but that was interesting. I nearly fell into it myself, I must admit, and then realized it was nonsense. It's a great poem. It's a great poem. Sonatina, famous poem. Of people, you know, the uh, the people who like the uh, the colloquial conversational Dario turned against. They tried to turn against this poem. They said. He's talking, what's he talking about? He's all flowery, he's all fairy tale. And in the end, they thought, no, this is some of the greatest, Daddy, or there is. This is some of the greatest poems ever written in the Spanish language. This is one of them. We can't ignore it. You know, they try to, they try to turn their back on it. And in the end, they come back to it and say, you can't live without this poem if you're a Spanish, a Spanish poet. Spanish, so it, it's a tremendous poem. Thank you, Adam, for this insight into the, the translation uh, wall. I think that Giovanni raised the hand again. So Giovanni, if you, if you want to contribute. No, okay. So I, I'm very conscious of time and they said that I could take a little bit longer than an hour, uh, but I know that some people have had to leave. So I'll try to be very brief. We'll move to the to the final poem that I selected. Um, and you know why I, this is one of my favorite poems, not just of Dario, but one of my favorite poems, full stop um, in, in the Spanish uh, language. Um, so this is um, Lo Fatal from Cantos de, de Vida y, y Esperanza. Um, oh, so we've, we've got Giovanni in the chat saying that the microphone is not working at all. I'm sorry, Giovanni. Um, so um, if you want, feel free to, to add uh, your comments on the chat and we'll come back to, to those um, later if you want. Um, okay, so let's read Lo Fatal, and then if, if Paul wants to read the translation, he's very welcome. <laughs> um, let's, let's go ahead. So, Lo Fatal, a René Pérez. Dichos el árbol que es apenas sensitivo, y más la piedra dura porque esa ya no siente, pues no hay dolor más grande que el dolor de ser vivo, ni mayor pesadumbre que la vida consciente. Ser y no saber nada, y ser sin rumbo cierto, y el temor de haber sido y un futuro terror, y el espanto seguro de estar mañana muerto, y sufrir por la vida y por la sombra y por lo que no conocemos y apenas sospechamos, y la carne que tienta con sus frescos racimos, y la tumba que aguarda con sus fúnebres ramos y no saber a dónde vamos, ni de dónde venimos. Go ahead. Our mortality to René Perez. Happy the tree that scarcely feels, happier still the harsh stone with no sense. The pain of living is all too real, the greatest sorrow is mortal conscience. To be to know nothing on an aimless path, the fear of having been and the terror to come, the certain horror of tomorrow's death, to suffer from life, from darkness, and from what we cannot know, though we have our doubts, from cool clusters of flesh that always tempt, and the tomb that waits with its somber boughs, unsure where we're going, where we're from, where we went. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I mean, my idea of breaking down um, in different rooms might not work because you won't have, you cannot share the screen on the on the breakout room. So I'm afraid we'll have to stay uh, in, in here. But I'm happy to take a back seat and, and 
let you just discuss the poem without me prompting anything in in the poem so it's completely up to you if you want i'll just say something about the poem or but if not i'm just happy to shut up and just uh listen listen to to you yeah i would just say if i may help just a little bit um uh, from my unexpert point of view um the word that leaps out in this point to me is terror um because it did seem to engender um a feeling of almost that really uh the harsh stone with no sense harsh stone and no sense um it, it really brings it through and the pain of living is all too real so it's all it, it's almost as if it, it it's not to do with one person i always think a poem like this is not just me i think we all as individuals can read this and um almost fear ourselves to a certain extent because we've all got our doubts we've all got mortality um and in a way i think it's so so deeply personal um and, and it's this feeling of uh, uncertainty uh, a feeling of um a partial horror um and not knowing what 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 what's coming next uh and even where where we're from and where we went uh, a cracking last last line so yet again i think uh, a very deeply personal um and an excellent poem yet again i mean you can tell these poems are world class instantly there's just something about them I completely agree. I mean, can I just ask Adam if you considered any other choices for the title? I mean, um, I, if I had had to translate into English, Lo Fatal, I mean, I would have just cried and, and I would have hidden under my desk. Um, how do you translate Lo Fatal? Because in Spanish that, that just conveys so much uh, that it's impossible to just you know, I'm, 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 I love the, the title that you went for. So I think that, you know, our, our mortality does summarize the, the, the issue in, in the poem. It's a, it's a, yeah, it's a very good question. Well, of course, I, it, it's the most difficult part of the poem is the title of this one, in this case. Did you, did you cry <laughs> trying to translate I mean, it? <laughs> I think it's a universe. I tried to get the universality, of course. So, you, so obviously I, I liked our, because he's talking to the reader, but he's, he's in cap talking about himself, but he means all of us, all human state. Of course, it's a poem about fear of death, which we all, everybody has. Um, my God, especially the times we're living today. My gosh, I mean, especially relevant today, this poem. Um, but I, I, yeah, I, 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 I thought long and hard, and that was the closest I could come up with. Um, uh, that. Uh, I think this poem has to rhyme. Nobody has rhymed. Nobody has translated this poem, into, as far as I know, into rhyme before. But and uh, no, and uh, it has to rhyme. Even to the extent where I've been free with the last two stanzas, this last stanza is free. It's the freest anyone's been with this poem. Uh, and that went, which which the Spanish doesn't say. That rhymes with tempt. That went. You know, racimos venimos. It has to rhyme, though. He deliberately uses that rhyme because it's a poem about the rhythm of life and the the uh, the movement, the swirling rhythm of life, the circle of life. The circle. If you don't rhyme where he rhymes, you're losing the meaning. It's back to meaning and, and music again. So, although he doesn't say where we went, I think I'm justified in in um, using that, and the, and the rhythm works. I think very well there. It's a, it's a which is it is his most famous Dario's most famous poem, um, which it's a bit like the equivalent of Pablo Neruda's uh, Poema Venti, you know, the poem Twenty. I can write the saddest night, uh, in the sense that it was like I iconic, an iconic poem, but it's ah, it's so genuine, so sincere, so full of pain, but on the same time, are there hopes? He's they're always in all Dario's poems, even the most despairing, you feel he's reaching out for hope. He's, 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 and he finds hope somewhere. That's what, and that's what I said last Thursday, that he was, a, he was an optimist despite everything. 
despite everything. Um, and that's what I, I find wonderful about his poetry. Uh, life enriching, life enhancing about his poetry, that he finds hope in the midst of despair. Absolutely. And I think that you just highlighted what I wanted to say about the poem. So if I can just offer, you know, a, a very quick uh, overview of, of Lo Fatal. So as you can see, it would look almost like a sonnet, but we are missing a final line in the last uh, Del Feto. So that's another way in which, you know, Dario was playing with our expectations, playing with, uh, with the, 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 the forms. But um, it's the, if if we look at the themes of Lo Fatal, obviously, you know, it's talking about death, fear of death, our mortality. Um, and yes, it is very pessimistic. It conveys this anguish. But this hope that Adam was talking about, this, you know, hope or at least, you know, uh, some this light, this ray, ray of hope, in there i've always like i've really enjoyed reading this poem always as a as a reflection of, of our mortality our fear of death but also how lucky we are to find, to have enough knowledge to appreciate it like we fear death because we know life and we are aware of what surrounds us and i think that's that's part of you know the hope that the poem transmits as well because it starts with Dicho es el árbol que es apenas sensitivo y más la piedra dura. So they they don't really live life to the full extent. They lack, you know, this experience that we as humans have. Um, they might be lucky because you know they they uh, that they they don't have to 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 feel this anguish or this fear, but we are much more our experiences make this life, this, you know, this circle life, death that Adam was talking about, this rhythm of our life is enhanced um, by, by all um, that, that we are. So it is a poem about, um, you know, our anguish, it's quite pessimistic, but there is also this ray um, of hope. Uh, and there is this almost obligation to actually leave, like the, the Dario is not giving up. Dario is leaving and carrying it, carrying on. So I think that's uh, that's something um, worth um, highlighting. But this just you know this reflection on our existence um, th that I I find very 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 powerful. Um, I'll, I'll I'll let you speak oh i could be talking about this poem all night so don't don't yeah. let me lose <laughs> yeah i find it uh, found this poem really very very emotional and uh, uh as a sort yes i can see as you have analyzed a certain optimism but uh, what's uh, the line the, the the sentence that had uh, impressed me most is that Pues no hay dolor más grande que el dolor de ser vivo. It's very, very, very hard. And uh, it's nothing to do, but it reminds me a bit also of Jorge Manrique, no? La, when his father dies, los uh, caminos, los ríos que llevan al mar, no? There is the destiny, uh, there is our fate is to die. And how we come across this uh, destiny uh, but uh, the impression I have of the poem is that uh, uh, Ruben Dario is in uh, almost total despair. That's my impression. Because uh, the, the, this sentence, pues no hay dolor más grande que el dolor de ser vivo. Uh, it's like uh, almost the existentialist of the 20th century, we, we could uh, say. And this, even the following line, this vida consciente, so it's the ser vivo, but, but also the vida consciente. But uh, anyway, it's uh, great, really it's great, uh, as all the poetry from Ruben Darío. Yeah, go ahead, Giselle. Thank you. I just uh, also wanted to say that um, this is part of Cantos de Vida y Esperanza, o sea, things of life and, and hope and um and and everyone agrees that 
este, cantos de vida y esperanza is a very complex and poetic war. It, it, it's a, he makes reflections of metaphysica, how you say metaphysica in English, I don't remember, um, but it, it, it concentrates symbols and reference and, and, and the, his worries and, and his, uh, his hopes and, and, and it evolves and at the end he finished with lo fatal, like, 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 like at the end, uh, after all the reflection through the books of he makes from, you know, uh, uh, the, all the, in all the poems at the end, he, um, he said, he, he puts this at the end, like closing and saying that for me, Lo Fatal is a doubt, is his doubt, is about, you know, his, all his beliefs is about doubt what is going to happen after we were, is, is, is if there is an after, but at the same time is, um, it's about it's a it's it's um it's there is a certainty where what it ends so it's uh it's it's the doubt between the knowing of being conscious as you mentioned but at the same time not knowing what is after um so so it's like a putting an enigma uh, so where we are in this war? What are we doing in this war? What are we, what what is our purpose in this in this war? Um, so and he mentions some of that in the Historia de mis libros, the history of my books. I think he, if I I am not, he he said something about you know that how he had read many philosophies and, and, he, um, and he continue questioning the existence. So, um, so I think it's, it's, it's a beautiful because it gives you, you know, what is our life? What is, you know, a human, a human being without questions, without question anything and everything. Absolutely. I, I agree with you. And this actually the questioning element comes in so many parts of the poem because he says, you know, la vida consciente, but he follows up saying, seri no saber nada. <laughs> so it's, it's this constant questioning of coming up with um, this uh, lo que no conocemos y apenas sospechamos. So this quest for, for knowledge as well and, and the constant questioning. Um, I don't know if anyone else has something to say about the poem. I'm sorry to have chosen a poem that has not been as uplifting as, as the others, as the final poem we will analyze. It's just that I've always just been in love with, with um, this poem. And it's I can a great see- poem. No, no, don't worry, because the, the, this is part of the level of, of life. So it's a great ending for the uh, for the presentation i think it's great no no problem and and so many other poets have um, had inspiration from this poem as well i don't know if you are familiar with the work um of jaime gil de vietma but the yes. poem no volveré a ser joven talks exactly about the same and he actually quotes not in that in that poem but he quotes Rubén Darío in many of his poems um, so so you know I, it just reminds me of No Volveré a Ser Joven and this questioning where we go and and the the the, the older you get the less you understand or or, or the, the more you you acknowledge that you don't know anything um, so um, just yeah, uh, actually we, we paid up two to Hilde Viedma in Cervantes Institute in Madrid this month. So it's a coincidence that we have uh, Ruben Darío in Manchester and Hilde Viedma in Madrid. Indeed, indeed, absolutely. Um, I've just seen um, in the chat, so Giovanni, because he was having problems with his microphone, uh, just brought in the chat that uh, he wanted to highlight Darío as a storyteller. 
uh, and I think that you know the storytelling also comes in here as this you know the life as a something that you know has has a flow um, Sonativa, los, mo los motivos del lobo, a Margarita, all our wonderful musical stories that grab the reader, not only for the musicality, but also for the story as a child growing up in Nicaragua and reading Darío in school, right? Um, so uh, the story is not just the music. So thank you, Giovanni. Uh, I think that that really encapsulates uh, what we've been, we've been reading um, uh, this evening. And Chris also said, I think we still have Chris there, but just in case the event ends too soon, he said, so I would like to say uh, that I've had a wonderful hour. Well, I think I've enjoyed this more than anyone. So I, I apologize for enjoying this more than, than the actual attendees. No, uh, not at all. You, you, you really, you brought as usual, your enthusiasm and your knowledge, the knowledge of poetry. And uh, sorry, the telephone is not at the right moment. Uh, thank you very much. It was really, really great. We are very, very happy and uh, we have uh, with the poetry uh, delighted with your analysis. Everything was just fair for from you. Thank you very much. And maybe now Giselle, you, the ambassador of my, if they want to say something also. Well, I just uh, wanted to say Thank you to all. Thank you for enjoying Ruben Darío. Thank you for um, reading Ruben Darío and continue, please continue reading for those who are discovering his poetry, his writing, and, 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 and you will discover a complete intellectual. Uh, he changed the way we uh, the, the way Spanish was written. It gave hope, it, it gave a new, a new light in the in, in, to the to the to the writing in Spanish, but also um, we will prove uh, Giovanni's uh, 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 comment about a storytelling of Ruben Darío. So we are going to have on um, uh, Friday, uh, the Friday, right. um, a, a session with uh, Ruben Darío para niños, yes. where, where we're going to try to entertain the and, and foment the love for Darío and the little ones. So thank you to all and keep um, spreading the word about Ruben Darío. He's not much known uh, as it should be in English and, 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 I, and this is a great, uh, um, and now it's a little bit more possible uh, thanks to Adam uh, with his translation, his magnificent translation of this uh, selection of poems, and, 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 and to Pedro Eusebio and the Cervantes in general for, uh, for, uh, um, for this collaboration in promoting uh, uh, the life and work of Ruben Darío, the knowledge of, about, of, about him. And, um, and because it's, uh, I have to say it, it's not just this Cervantes, it's the Cervantes in Spain, in, in Madrid, it's the Cervantes in Belgica, it's the Cervantes in many other uh, 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 cities of, of Europe and, and the world that um, is, reading Ruben Darío is promoting the reading, the knowledge about Ruben. So thank you very much to all and I'll see you soon.